welcome to the Born Free podcast, where we'll discuss the challenges facing the world's wildlife and ecosystems. My name's Sarah Locke and I'll be talking to the passionate people doing their bit to try and secure a future where wildlife and humans can peacefully coexist. So today we're joined by Dr. Matt McLennan from the Belindi Chimpanzee um, and Community Project out in Uganda. Welcome, Matt. Um, Hi. Do you want to start with telling us a little bit about the project? Hi. Um, well, first of all, thanks for having me um, today. Um, okay, so our project, the Belindi Chimpanzee and Community Project, is a project that conserves chimpanzees that are living on local people's land in village areas in Uganda. Amazing. And you actually started the project out in 2015, is that right? But I know that you'd visited earlier in kind of like 2006 for your PhD, is that right? Yeah, so I first went to Uganda as a PhD student in 2006. So I was going to study um, wild chimpanzees. And um, rather than going to like a big area of forest, which is uh, where most studies of great apes were done at at that time, what I was interested in in is... um, where chimpanzees were living right, you know, in very close proximity to people outside of a protected area in village areas. So I, I went to a place called uh, Belindi in Hoima district where chimpanzees were living in small forests all around um, with villages all around. And, um, and that's where it started. Amazing. And actually, the, it's kind of situated in between two, two larger blocks of forest, is that right? And they're protected reserves? Yeah. So um, in midwestern Uganda, there are two main forests. One's called the Bonongo Forest, and 50 kilometres or, or 35 miles to the south, you have Bogoma Forest. And you know, these have really big populations of chimps, about 600 each. But in this middle area... Um, There are also chimpanzees, but they're outside the protected areas. These are on local people's land, um, you know, around villages. So are you one of the first um, researchers kind of looking into this then? Yeah, at that time, um, I believe uh, there had been very few studies of that, that interaction between humans and chimpanzees where they're sharing the same landscape. So your PhD, what kind of thing, what did you end up looking at and what were the kind of resulting um, conclusions from that? Well, when I when I first went to um, Belindi, I, you know, I had this notion of studying chimpanzees in forest fragments uh, around villages. And um, I, I, I sort of I got, I got more 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 than I bargained for because um, the situation on the ground was sort of more difficult than I could have expected. I found that the forests, so these are small forests along rivers, um, which are owned by local households, just um, maybe, uh, you know, 40, 50 acres in size. And the forests were being completely cut down while I was doing my PhD. Um, There were chainsaws everywhere, everywhere you went. Um, So rather than sort of um, finding a static situation, I found a really dynamic situation in which the chimpanzees were experiencing, you know, rapid habitat change. Um, the forests were just going. Um, so that became the, the focus of my, my PhD study is how ch- the chimps were adapting to this changing conditions. How were they um, changing their behavior and how were they coping with sort of, you know, this really quick human encroachment? And what what were the kind of ch- changes in behaviour? I assume conflict must be right at the top of that. Yeah, there was uh, there was a lot of conflict. The you know what what, what we found, and what some other studies uh, have also found, is chimpanzees are surprisingly adaptable. You know, we have this notion of 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 them as um, primarily forest dwelling creatures that are quite perhaps um, conservative in their habits in in their diet, for example. Mm-hmm. But um, what we found is. The chimpanzees readily eat people's crops, agricultural crops. So as the forests were being cut down, well, you know, the chimps are seeing all their natural foods disappearing. So they start going into people's gardens, up to people's homes, looking for looking for food. So there was that issue. And of course, that creates conflicts with the um, with the landowners, with the, with, with the villagers, um, but also they were, they were sort of adapting to increasing encounters with people in an interesting way so when I first started going into the forest um, the chimpanzees were really aggressive uh, which wasn't what I was expecting you know um, unhabituated chimps so chimps that are not used to human observers are normally quite shy they run Mm -hmm. away when they see people so we would go into the forest and the adult male chimps would instead 
um, surround us and try to intimidate us, you know, uh, displaying, um, banging on, you know, um, drumming on trees and, and making a lot of noise. And it was really very effective. And uh, a couple of times, you know, the chimps re- tried very, very hard to push us out of the forest. And at, at the time, this was not normal chimp behavior. So what we thought was, okay, the way we interpreted this was that, you know, they're coming in, into contact with chimps, ev- uh, with people every day. So their strategy was to try and intimidate people. Oh, okay. So you actually thought that that was why it was because they had seen, they it was because they were living on the fringes of, of people's homes. Yeah. And, and they were experiencing this really rapid habitat disturbance. Suddenly people were everywhere with chainsaws cutting down all the, all the trees. So, so the chimps were, I guess, kind of, kind of fighting back. Okay. And how many chimps, um, what are their populations like now? And also in comparison to kind of w- when you first started out? Well, okay. So the, the site where I have studied one group of chimps, there, at the time when I first went there, there was about 35 chimps. But these are part of a regional population of 300 that mm-hmm. are living in village areas. You know, there's, there's, there's about 10 resident groups um, in this corridor area. Uh, uh, living around uh, uh, villages. So there were about 35 chimps at Belindi. Um, when I returned after finishing my PhD, writing up my dissertation, I came back in 2012 after four years, and um, there were about 19, there were 19 chimps, so the population had, had decreased. Okay. And and so um, those 35, do they um, migrate m- much amongst themselves? I mean, do they go into the, the two patches of forest that we were talking about? No, they, um, they're, they're sort of, um, they're, they're situated right in the middle of the corridor. So they're about 20 miles from Bodongo Forest in the north and, and, and 25 to Bogoma. But um, there are other groups of village chimps you know, you know, all um, surrounding them. So, um, so there's migration between these groups of chimps around the villages. Amazing. And um, I know that you've been doing, or you and your colleagues have been doing a lot of research on the chimps, you know, research and long-term monitoring. Um, do you want to tell us what have been some of the, the um, important findings that you found? Well, um, for me, what's mo- as, as a researcher, mm. what's most interesting is the way the chimps adapt um I think, like i was saying before you know it's been really surprising how resilient they are um is that because they're so smart i guess they're kind of um you know they're finding new ways to forage and were you saying earlier actually um that you've seen sometimes they actually go into people's homes you know they're becoming a bit braver they know we're less of a threat than they maybe originally thought yeah i mean obviously chimps are very intelligent um they're very smart animals and um so they're very flexible in in their behaviour, and so as the circumstances have changed, as the forests have have gone and been replaced by farmland, well, you know, I guess I guess for the chimps, they they have two choices: either we, you know, um, we put up with a situation and and and, um, and and starve, or or we make best of it, and and that's what they do. They, um, you know, they start eating more and more foods. Now, human crops are generally more. Nutritious, higher in energy, higher in carbohydrates um, uh, than some of the wild foods. So, by eating a lot of crops, the chimps are in pretty good condition. Um, you know, the chimps. Plus, aren't I guess it's easier. Uh, you know, it's just it's a whole field of. Yeah, ab- absolutely. So, um, so in Belindi, for example, the chimps' favourite uh, crop food is jackfruit, which is the world's biggest fruit. It's about um, it can bite you know twenty kilograms one fruit. So um, a chimp can go and grab grab one jackfruit and that's them done for the rest of the day. They don't need it forage, they can just rest or you know or or, or socialize. So um, yeah, they're under difficult circumstances, but there are also some benefits. And I've seen as well, um, I mean I saw um a, a video of them um, going under barbed wire fences and stuff. They're they're clearly you know so clever and kind of kind of just work around um, the barriers that humans put up. Um, yeah. What about infrastructure like roads? Have you seen? Well, um, roads present a real threat to to, to chimps. So um, Uganda is developing fast, and and that's a that's a great thing for Uganda. Um, it's not a good thing for for the chimps. So. In Belindi, there used to be a, a, a dirt road that passed through right through the middle of the, the chimps' range. About three years ago, it was upgraded um, as part of regional infrastructural developments, and now it's a four-lane highway. Um, 
Like and tarmac? Is that, yeah, yeah it's, 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 it's tarmac. And, but the chimps still have to cross it because, you know, they've, in order to, you know, access food on, on, on either side of the road. Um, they have adapted to this. They show quite a lot of uh, road safety. So you see them waiting at the side of the road, waiting to cross, looking to see, you know, is there much traffic? Is there much human pedestrian traffic? Um, and they tend to try and cross when there's a break, when, when it's a bit quiet. But still, it's um, it's really dangerous, and there have been some collisions, and chimps have died. And are there plans for even more? Inf- I mean, I assume there are for even more um, infrastructure around. I mean, is there anything you can do? You know, like I've seen um, elephant corridors and things that go under roads. Would that work for chimpanzees? Um, sort of. You mean sort of like a tunnel under yeah. the road? Um, it probably would. Um, or maybe I- it's not necessary for chimpanzees if they show that intuition to look both ways. What we're trying to do is um, talk to the road authorities and try to encourage them to install speed bumps, which are, are common on the Ugandan roads anyway. Um, I think as, as long as the traffic is, is slowed, you know, not going 70, 80 miles an hour, um, then chimps are probably, uh, uh, you know, that makes, that makes it a lot safer for the chimps. Yeah. Um, and when we talk about safety and obviously um casualties that you've seen on those Mm. did you know those chimps i know that you referred earlier to them as kind of like family groups how well do you know the individuals um well right now our project is monitoring four of the groups in in the corridor there are about 10 groups we're monitoring four so we're getting to know those individuals um the chimps I know the best are the ones I've been studying since 2006 at Belindi. So we know we know all of those individuals very well. We know their family relationships. We know their history. So the first chimp that was killed on the road was in 2015, and that was a female we'd called Olive. And yeah, you know we knew we knew she had infant. She had an infant. Mm-hmm. She had um, a juvenile. And um, yeah, it it does make it more difficult if you if if you have a sort of a personal uh history of interactions with so the, with you you do name them yeah we name them um because you know it's, it's this common it's just, at, at um at, at, at most primate research sites it's a way of distin- distinguishing the individuals and of course with animals like chimps they are highly individual animals i was going to ask how do you distinguish them um yeah th- is it through their face I, what yeah they, um chimpanzees have uh Distinct faces, just like people do. So, um, you know, once you've got your eye in, it's really easy. You can't, you know, you can't fail to distinguish yeah, individuals. Well. Okay, I feel like that's a very simple question. Is in it's I can like imagine with lions or whatever. I know that you count the whiskers, don't you? Yeah. But I'm trying to imagine the same for for chimpanzees. Um, and you were saying actually um, before we came on, you were talking about how uh, there was a bit. There's a bit of an issue with um, low, like the local community i guess when you name what were you saying that was the problem with the naming well um, um so so when we talk to local people about our work and we show them photographs of the chimpanzees mm-hmm. we show them uh, videos and of course you know they get to know that we have named these these animals and it can be confusing because you know we've had people saying okay if you've given the animal a name that means you own them or you're trying to say they are like people, or so, well, f- things like that. So we, you know, we, we explain. Well, no, it's it's just a way for us to be able to distinguish these animals. Of course, the animals don't know that we've called one Mary or one, you know, um, Sylvester, or you know. So, um, and they do understand once you explain yeah, it like that. And you must. So I know I know that you work really closely with the community in um, Hoima. Is it the Hoima district? Sorry, Hoima is yeah. the district. Yeah, yes. yeah. Um, so, what are the kind of community-based work that you do? I know that you employ um, a number of local people, don't you, in your project? Yeah, um, we're very much a grassroots project. Mm-hmm. Obviously, um, there's me and my partner Jackie, who you know, who established the project. But we we try to uh, take a back seat, and we have a really good team of of, of local staff who are all local to the area. Most of them are from villages um, within the chimp ranges. And um, so, it's, yeah, we're very grassroots. And all of our uh, project activities are designed to... It's not just about... It's, it's OK, it's about conserving chimps, but it's about increasing people's capacity to accommodate sharing their their backyard, their their, their landscape with these animals. So... You know, if we're going, if we're saying that these animals are precious, that they they must be conserved or they should be conserved, um, then the benefits for people of 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 living alongside them have to outweigh the cost considerably, right? So, so what we try to do is improve people's quality of lives. We give them, um, we develop with them 
uh, livelihood alternatives to relying on the remaining forest patches. And um, we try to make it uh, better so that they're actually happy that the chimps are there. Yeah, and I guess we are talking about people living in poverty, yes. you know, in rural locations. Um, and what are the kind of alternative livelihood strategies that, you're, that you work in? Okay, so um, the last uh, 10, 15 years, many farmers have shifted from traditional uh, subsistence agriculture um, to cash cropping, right, to make... Um, uh, to make a living, to pay for their children's education and, and, and all that kind of thing. So um, the two cash crops that have really been detrimental to um, forests in the region have been um, tobacco and rice because um, both crops uh, have sort of sort of require virgin soil. So farms clear the forest and they plant tobacco, rice in the wetlands. And anyway, those two crops have really been a driver of deforestation. So what we're trying to do is promote uh, coffee as an alternative cash crop it's um it's something that many farmers grow anyway um the market's you know going up it's it's it's, um it's a good good crop economically and people don't have to clear any forest for it It, coffee grows well in 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 people's uh, existing gardens and uh, another benefit is that chimpanzees don't eat it so it doesn't create those those problems those conflicts um with farmers yeah Uh, no amazing and i know that you're also quite heavily involved um in um, reforestation schemes, is that right? Yeah, so um, you know, w- one of our main project components is raising tree seedlings. We have um, seven, project, uh, seven tree nurseries in different parts of the corridor, in different villages, and um, we, we distribute seedlings to local people who are interested in planting. We don't just give out the seedlings um, and then you know, um, forget about it. We, we work with the farmers through all stages of raising the seedlings, planting them, then monitoring monitoring them. So um, we encourage people to plant uh, along the wetlands, along the rivers where the forest has been cut. And, and it's completely voluntary, and people are really interested in planting. It's almost like um, there was a period of 10 or 20 years where people cut all the forest in order to plant crops. But now people are seeing some of the disadvantages of removing all the tree cover so there's a lot of interest in replanting. I guess they want something as well that is um, efficient. Yes. And clearly, if things haven't been working, they're, they're looking for alternative yeah, yeah. Um, opportunities. And that's something that you can help advise on. Um, so what about working in schools? Do you try and do some kind of like uh, educational impact work? Yes, we have a, um, an education program. Uh, what we try to do is um, increase... Okay, at the moment we're, f- we're focusing on school children. We, we try to increase their interest in the chimpanzees. Um, for many people, even though they see chimps a lot, they often see them um, when they're in their gardens, you know, um, eating their crops or, you know, and um, often when children bump into chimps, they start screaming, then, then the chimps start behaving aggressively and, and, and um, children have been hurt. So we try to... It's try to increase um, the kids' interest in the chimps. We explain about their behaviours and we show videos and media um, to show them these are your chimps. These are these are the chimps that you see in your daily life. The, you know, in your gardens, crossing the road, um, and the kids get really, really interested. Yeah, I guess um, you. I guess it would always be in negative con- a context when they see them. Just naturally, I guess it would be in. Yeah, as you say, that they, they would be crop raiding, or it would be when. Um, I guess there must be competition over water sources. Yes. Um, so I guess it's really good. And I know that you were saying that you did a kind of like meet the chimps and showed them videos. What was the What were the children's reactions to they, that? They They're absolutely fascinated. Um, you know, they they haven't. Most of them haven't had an opportunity to observe, to, to see sort of intimate aspects of chimpanzee family life. Um, you know, we, we we can explain that this chimp is the brother of this one, and you, you give some sort of stories about you know that have happened. Um, I think it really helps to create a sense of um, ownership of the animals. These are their animals. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and you hear you hear the children in the villages sometimes um, saying, "Oh, we have seen Sylvester. We have seen oh, this so one or nice. that one." Yeah. Also, it must be really nice. I think chimpanzees must actually be quite a nice um, species to do it with, only in that you can kind of see human uh, behaviours reflected. Um, you know, when you see the videos of them using tools or um, you know, I, we saw that video of um, them chasing away a dog. It's, mm. You can see that's quite easy for a child. You'd hope to like see that kind of reflected in them. Yeah, I think, um, you know, people um, can, can readily see that these are 
intelligent animals and they and they have many behaviors um, that are similar to people and since you first started i don't know if, like 2006 or 2015 when the when the project actually started but have you seen a change in um the community's behavior okay so oh, um, sorry sorry not behavior I didn't, you know um, um attitudes. Their, yeah, attitudes, um, yeah yeah absolutely when we, so we, we started the project in 2015 so um, we're now in the fifth year and um yeah that um People, I think, um, people, uh, people want p their problems to be heard. So a lot of people were very frustrated that they were um, chimpanzees were eating their crops, um, you know, roaming around their homes, and there was no one, no one listening. So by addressing some of their concerns, their priorities, helping them, um, you know, we we have various projects like water boreholes, um, we give out energy stoves, we give out the seedlings, we do the education. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, many people do think this is this is a help and as a result okay yeah the chimps are always going to be difficult neighbors but they're sort of they become more accepting of that it makes it so much easier doesn't yeah. it to deal with um and uganda the, the government doesn't offer compensation schemes is that right not currently do you, the project or no, is that not something um, that we, you... we, we don't know we don't compensate because um in, in uganda by law um the uganda wildlife authority is responsible for the management of all animals oh i see but they don't currently have a policy of compensating farmers for, for crop losses, particularly away from the protected areas. Um, I believe that law is, 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 um, is going to be changed. Um, but a lot of people feel very frustrated that they have these animals that the government says um, are endangered. Yeah, they're protected, protected by law. Um, so people can't kill them. And if they do, there are penalties. Mm -hmm. So you know, people feel really frustrated that they're not getting help. Yeah, of course. And uh, um, this might not be the case. Is bush uh, is bushmeat trade an issue in Uganda or not so much? Not, not so much. So um, most of the local uh, people in, in Uganda, they don't have a tra tradition of eating primates, including chimps, mm -hmm. for food. So it's unlike other parts, particularly Central Africa, um, you know, where chimps are heavily hunted. So at the same time, it's this, um, we can call it a food taboo, that has enabled... The chimpanzees to, to to survive after a lot of the forest has gone because you know the the, the forests are gone chimps are still there they're not hunted um so that's really created this this sort of close uh, proximity oh, that's great so just lastly and thank you so much for like time has whizzed by but um what are your goals for 2020 you know for the the project what are your key initiatives that you really want to work on um well, we want to keep the momentum going. Uh, one of, I would say, the most important lessons that we have learned working in village areas is that there has to be um, continuity. You've mm -hmm. got to keep the project going. If you if you come in for six months and then go away again, you know you're, the impact is going to be is not going to be that much. So, from my point of view, um, if you know, the international community, if Uganda says these animals are worth conserving, this is going to take years, maybe decades of very careful management, a lot of sympathy, a lot of support for local people. Um, so for us, we just want to build upon our activities. We'd like to um, expand into some of some additional villages where we're not currently working. Um, yeah, and just really keep things going and really, um, you know, make the project a success. Amazing. And where can people go to find out more about you? Um, well, um, we do have a website, mm -hmm. Belindi Chimpanzees. Mm, we'll put it in the show notes. We'll put it in the show notes. Yes. Um, <laughs> um, also, we have a Facebook page. We're active on social media. And, of course, on Born, Born Free's website, I believe. Yeah, of course. Um, we're I was, featured I was on about that. to plug that yeah. as well. <laughs> no, nice. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Matt. Thank you very much. Thanks. And thank you for the support from Born Free. Thank you for listening to the Born Free podcast. If you've enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to our YouTube channel to watch the episodes, follow us on social media, or head to our website, bornfree.org.uk. My name's Sarah Locke, and our producer is Philip Fortuna. See you next time.